Welcome. I'm Raphael Chacon, Director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our panel discussion, African Speak. Uh, but first, it's important for us to acknowledge that the Montana Museum of Art and Culture is on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, and today we honor the path they have always showed us in caring for this place and for generations to come, to which we at the museum like to add that art has always been a part of this place. So before I describe today's program and introduce our panelists, uh, allow me to thank our generous sponsors. So the Montana Arts Council, whose ongoing support has made much of our educational programming possible, and Humanities Montana, whose distribution of CARES Act funds uh, have allowed for the creation of our virtual docent tours. So the program uh, today coincides with the exhibition at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture in Missoula titled Homage to Africa, the Tony Hoyt and Molly Shepard Collections. Uh, the show has been extended through May 8th, uh, 2021, in our galleries at the University of Montana's PARTV Center. I want to encourage everybody to visit this exhibition. It's exquisite. Whether you do that virtually or whether you do that live, it's a wonderful show and you shouldn't miss it before it closes on May 8th. If you're interested in a scheduling a socially distanced docent tour for 10 people or less, uh, please contact Ashley Rickman at 406-243-2019, 406-243-2019. And you can find links to our virtual docent tours at our website at umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum, umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. There are also a slew of videos related to the exhibition on our YouTube channel as well. And don't forget to subscribe to those. Uh, today's session is being recorded and, uh, and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So today we have a conversation with four remarkable panelists. They're all Montanans of African descent. So um, the first one is Wilmot Collins, and I'll just read these uh, brief introductions alphabetically. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, Mr. Collins is here. Mr. Collins was born in Liberia. He's a well-known politician who serves as mayor of our capital city, Helena, Montana. In a spectacular upset, Mr. Collins defeated a four-term incumbent mayor in 2017 to become the first black person to be elected mayor of any city in Montana since achieving its statehood in 1889. A refugee from the first Liberian Civil War, Mr. Collins came to the States in 1994. And prior to his election as mayor, he worked for the Montana Department of Health and Human Services, specializing in child protection. For the last two decades, he has also been a member of the United States Navy, Navy Reserve. And he and his lovely wife have two children, a daughter, Jamie, and their son, Bliss. Um, by the way, um, Mr. Collins and I have a few things in common, uh, besides the fact that we're both political refugees who call Montana home. Um, I can't say that I can hold a candle to any of his great achievements, uh, certainly his political achievements, but I do have one leg up on Wilmot Collins, and that is I was born five days earlier. So that makes us both good Libras. Um, our next panelist, Hannah Shewamolta Tumeshesha, has been a doctoral student in counselor education and supervision at the University of Montana since 2017. She holds an MA from the University of Montana in counselor education and a Master's of Education in Special Needs Education from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, and her BA in Psychology from the University of Gondar, also in Ethiopia. Prior to coming to the States, um, she taught at the University of Gondar for 10 years. Her research and service interests include mental health, education, and disability-related issues. She has presented her research at academic conferences in Ethiopia, Lithuania, and throughout the US. Ms. Meshesha currently works as a teaching assistant in U of M's Department of Counseling and is a graduate research assistant at the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities at the University of Montana. Our next panelist, Dr. Joyce Mpandi Finn, is a Malawian born in Zambia. She was graduated from the University of Malawi with a degree in education and afterwards worked as a high school teacher in banking and as a, a trainer in, uh, for Peace Corps volunteers. She has moved uh, she moved to the United States in 1990, where she earned a degree in business administration from Berea College in Kentucky, and her master's in counseling and doctorate in counselor education and supervision from the University of Montana. She is well, uh, she's currently an associate professor at MSU Northern in Haver, Montana, where she lives with her, quote, 
devastatingly handsome husband, Charles, and their devastatingly cute cat, Lutza. <laughs> I can attest to both. It's a truthful statement. Uh, and our final panelist is Nanso Maxwell Obiyeisi, who was born in Nigeria. He is a junior majoring in biochemistry, president of the Black Student Union, and a member of Phi Delta Theta fraternity at the University of Montana. As an avid lover of medicine and books, he aspires to become both a gynecologist and a best-selling author. He enjoys reading, music, and sharing his culture with those around him. And when not studying in Montana, he is in New Jersey, New Jersey visiting his brother. So welcome to our panelists. I hope um, Mr. Mayor has joined us, and if not, uh, he can jump in at any moment. So uh, welcome to all of you. And let's go ahead and start with our first question. And uh, this is to all of the panelists. The first question is, uh, tell us something about, uh, tell us something you miss terribly about your homeland. So we'll start with Dr. Mpandi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, to hear about our stories, our African stories. Um, what I miss, God, I, I feel like I miss everything. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I miss everything. No, but I think mostly I miss my family, of course, because uh, most of my family is still home. But I miss the food. I miss the food. And so I'm always looking for something that looks like food from home. Um, and there are some stores that you find where they sell those things, but not have a Montana though. Um, and the, I just miss the connections that we have, those natural connections that we have at home, where you don't have to go looking for friends, for people, for connections, because they're just there. So I miss that. I miss that a whole lot. Yeah, and there are many other things I miss. Well, we are talking about art today. I miss that too. You know, I miss um, the, the community, community way of looking at everything around us, appreciating everything around us. I miss that. I miss it in the African way that, you know, like you can't even, you can't buy that. Um, yeah, but I live in Harbour, Montana, so <laughs> maybe I miss everything. <laughs> Great. Hannah, what do you miss most about uh, Ethiopia? Gosh, this is the most difficult question because my answer is also I miss everything. I've been out of my country for almost four years now. And looking back, I think I miss the most. What I miss the most is the people, uh, my neighbors and my friends, um, the time that I used to spend with them and mostly the food i make it up and food try to all the time but it's never been the same like this too this is a panel i, I tell you it's, it, it has it's never been the same the, um, the ethiopian coffee which is mostly ceremonial for us and i just miss having that like inviting people and spending time having a conversation over a coffee and food uh the holiday that we spend together uh, it's just, I think that sense of commonality and sense of togetherness is the most that I miss. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, please for, uh, don't forget to uh, mute yourselves. So we're still on the first question. Uh, Nanso, what do you miss most about uh, your home? Well, I mean, I think at this point, like everybody has said it all. Um, it's always the food. Like it's always the food. That's the that's the one thing that just hits you when you like move from your country to here, and it's just like, okay, and, like, where is the food still? And then like in Missoula, like because when I moved here, I lived in uh, New York before I moved to Jersey, so it's a lot more diverse over there. Moving here for college, it was. Uh, it was kind of an, another culture shock because then you had to start looking. The first thing I was looking for in stores is just, I need to know, do they have an African restaurant? Do they have like, you know, places, section for African ingredients? Because I love cooking. And that is like one of the most painful things you can do to someone who loves cooking is to put him in a place where like he's not familiar with anything. And it's just, I had to start um, improvising and just like 
because I, I cook a lot. I make a lot of soups and like jollof rice and like fried rice and just, just different like African dishes, um, Nigerian dishes. And like, it was hard just adjusting. And I, may, I miss the festivities because that's a, for me, that's a, we're talking of art and that's a like huge part of the art because then during festivities, these people were dressing up, you know, in traditional attire, dancing, the music. It's just like, I miss all of that a lot. And um, it just, um, I think Dr. Finn said this, but like just the community, just like talking to people, people that understand you, like people you can tell jokes with or like just talk and just like, it'll be just more like natural. But yeah, I miss all of that <laughs> and yeah. so much more. It's interesting how I, when, whenever we talk about m what's missing around the art, the context, I always think of music. I, did, I think of drumming. I think of dancing. I think of all of that, the celebrative parts. But I rarely think of food, and yet food is integral to culture, is it? <laughs> it's integral. It's, it's what brings us together. Because if you go to a lot of like homes in like Nigeria, and I, can, I probably think of in a lot of African countries too, like these people serve you food. It's just a way to just sit down and just like enjoy and just talk with people over food. It brings people together, and I do it here too. Like every time I have, I'm like I invite my friends over, I'm always cooking just to just like because it's the best way to just like build connection with people. Indeed. Indeed. So has uh, the mayor joined us? Is Mr. Mayor here yet? Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and jump to the, uh, the second question. And that is, since we're really gathering because of this wonderful ex uh, exhibition, the homage to Africa, uh, currently on view at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, I want to talk about your, your understanding and your knowledge of uh, Africa's artistic heritage. So this is a question about your childhoods. Um, were you aware of art when you were growing up? Do you come from artistic families? Did you visit museums or even collect art when you were kids? Uh, how much did you learn about Africa's artistic traditions when you were in school? And anybody, please, of the, the three panelists, anybody jump in uh, wherever you'd like. I can start. Um, I don't come from an artistic family. Um, however, I think culture and art is an integral part of the way we live. So we don't necessarily have to come from an artistic family to learn. Um, I can talk about literature, for example, which is a part of school and part of the way of I learned how to read and write. And Ethiopia is one of the countries uh, in the world to have its own alphabet. Uh, so our literature and the way we tell story uh, is almost ingrained with us when we grow up and when we learn how to tell our own story. Um, for example, dancing, uh, traditional clothes, I learned it from my family because that's how uh, we were told we have to celebrate our cultures and our tribal heritage, ethnic heritage. Uh, that's how it starts. So I see it in, in terms of the way of life, uh, even though it's not necessarily integrated into the curriculum and the structure. Um, growing up in mostly in elementary education, I rem remember learning and being a part of music club so we would perform some music or do drama. <laughs> I was not good at it, but I remember performing some drama for grade two, grade three. Uh, so we had those kind of exposures that um, kind of, uh, you know, nurtured our creativity to, to some extent. Um, in Ethiopia, our traditional clothes, just like any country in Africa, I think has this distinct nature of clothing and our fabric is different. Uh, so every Ethiopian wears its own tradition for holidays. So the clothes I'm wearing, it, it just represents our culture. So I would say it's more of uh, more represented in the way we live and how we show up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Joyce? Yeah, yeah, I would like to agree with everything, you know, that Hannah said. Uh, like you grow up and it's all around you. And so whether it's the clothing, like she's talking about that, that's the traditional dressing. And, and it's so artistic. <laughs> you know, somebody else might look at it, 
our clothes and look at it as, oh my God, that's so artistic, but that's our clothing, that's part of us. Um, the music around us. And I remember growing up, um, my father used to take us to museums, but I think I never appreciated that until I was grown up. Like, oh my God, that really helped me to see, um, to identify what was beautiful about where I grew up, whether it was in Zambia or Malawi or Zimbabwe uh, and other places where we lived. The art that we saw in the museums then, I think when I was younger, we were just like, oh my God, oh my God, you were excited, we're kids. But later on, I appreciated that, wow, I was exposed to that, you know, at a very early age in life. And so I just learned to appreciate uh, what, what was around me. And <laughs> Hannah talked about acting and all that. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of art as well. I was involved with that and a friend of mine, Dulce Caesar, uh, we started an acting company in Malawi after I graduated from my university. So we we were like, we expressed ourselves through that. But um, the music, traditional dances, uh, that's part of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, in schools, I, I didn't feel like we were taught more on it, maybe because we were part of, part of it. But I remember when I was in college, at, when I was at the University of Malawi, um, taking English and uh, history um, and English as my major, that's when I got more exposed. That's when I started to be, to be very appreciative of things around me because we were taught by the British. And so uh, that's when I start, started realizing how important what was around me, the arts and crafts that people were making, uh, how important that was to me. Um, and the importance of what it represented traditionally too, because they were, or even though the British colonized us, but it, uh, that artistic way of looking at things, people were already doing that in a traditional way, but uh, because it was just part of us and uh, it wasn't put out there as something like extraordinary because it was within us. And so, yeah. So in schools, really, I think when I started appreciating it even more was when I was at the university. Nansa, what about you? What, um... Tell us about your, your connections to the arts as, a, as growing up. Yeah, um, mine is just pretty similar to everything that has been said. You know, it's something that, you know, you're born into and as you grow, you learn it as you grow. Um, it's, um, I didn't, I wouldn't really say I come from a very artistic family, but my father was a very traditional man. So like, um, we go back, uh, yeah, during I really thought about it. Well, I have that left and just, you know, you meet people, yeah, right and you, you, um, you learn, you learn more about your culture. It wasn't really taught much in schools because again, you have to understand in Nigeria, there's over like 250 to 300 ethnic groups. So like there's different, there's like culture, different subcultures in the general culture. So like different people coming from like different ethnic groups. And so they, you know, I'm Igbo, I come from an Igbo tribe. And so like in schools you have, um, you can make a choice between like taking each of these classes. Like I took an Igbo class and a Yoruba person will take a Yoruba um, language class to just learn more about their culture and stuff. And sometimes, um, they, I think they also kind of make a little bit, they kind of, I mean, I won't really say it's a mistake, but like they kind of like, um, because you know, we're kids going to school, they kind of generalize everything together. And um, I um, think looking at it now, it's not like something that probably should have done because they should have let each one have its own unique, um, you know, um, at time, I'd say just like um, for each individual to just you know, understand your ethnic, you know, traditions better. But um, yeah, so that's how you also get the general knowledge of like other ethnic communities in schools and people that you meet and you um, you come in contact with and they tell you about your own traditions and, um, you know, stuff. I didn't really go to um, any art um, museums because uh, my mom was very overprotective growing up, so um, I didn't really go to a lot of places. But um, 
Yeah, uh, but it's something, again, that you just learn as you grow and your family talks about and you talk about it with your friends and, like, you go to your villages and, you know, you witness it yourself. You observe and you see it. And, um, you know, you take, like, uh, they were saying drama classes and stuff. I took a drama class. I was not very good at acting, but we did the best we could. Um, but, like, yeah, um, you know, um, you do all this, just be involved and you just you just learn and you keep learning, like, since from the moment of birth till you grow. You just you learn a lot, and you start to pick up on other people's uh, cultures too. So I don't I don't want to generalize, but it sounds like all of you have this this a notion of the arts as lived rather than something that you you go out to seek or whatever. It's something that sort of surrounds you. Um, and I guess my a follow up question is: so so you obviously learned something about your own your own traditions, your own communities, right? Your own people to uh, uh, to use that term. How much of what what you were um, uh, uh, what you were what you learned growing up was really about Pan African? Was sort of like the continent as a whole versus your particular um, your particular group, your particular community? Yeah, Do you have a, a greater sense of the 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 the, the continent as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and I think. As I am thinking about your question, I'm thinking about history um, in a state of art. And if it comes based on history, yes, we learn a lot of history because Ethiopia as um, a country that has never been colonized and the history that we have as a, a one of the, the countries that started the Pan-African movement, um, it, it is one of, you know, the major things that we learn in school. Um, like when it comes to art, architectural designs, um, because of the Hewan church that we have in Ethiopia, we learn those things in the classroom. But if it comes, if we are talking about the details and the ways of life of other countries in Africa, then I think it's limited and rather we come across uh, to that information when we grow up in personal research and personal, uh, personally seeking for those information um, in Africa. And I would say that for the generation right now with the internet and with more technology, more travel and connection, there is more opportunity to learn about which African country has what kind of culture uh, compared to how we grow up because the information uh, exchange was really limited. Uh, like I'm talking about the years in, uh, gosh, I'm having trouble translating the, the year because we have a different calendar. Uh, but <laughs> uh, 90s in the year in the 90s, it would have been difficult for uh, Ethiopians to know what culture exists in other countries in Africa. Uh, but I think now children have more opportunities to learn those cultures. And Dr. Pandi, remind me, you you tr traveled quite a bit when you were uh, uh, young, right? So, so that was the, that was that was the way you learned about other other cultures, other other countries, right? Through travel. Yes, yes, exactly to travel. And then the other advantage that I ha I had, I think, for me, I know that because when I graduated from University of Malawi, I became a teacher. I was a high school teacher. And so I used to teach English and history. So I had to, you know, like whether it was in college or when I was teaching, I needed to know about Africa. <laughs> so I needed to teach students about Malawi, the history of Malawi. And then I needed also to teach the history of Africa. And then <clears throat> the red, you know, the red China history, and then the world history. And so I guess, um, for Africa, the, ha having to have an idea of the cultures, it was, uh, I was privileged to have that. And it was quite uh, an opportunity for me to learn more about other cultures in on the African continent through my teaching. Uh, but also with the travels, my father was in the hotels and so we were able to travel where, wherever he worked. And so that also was good exposure for us, me and my siblings, uh, yeah. If you could summarize 
all of you, if you could summarize and say, what is Africa's greatest artistic contribution to the world, to humanity? What, what would you say that is? Well, oh, oh, no, sir, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say it's the culture, the resources, and the tradition, because um, Africa's culture has influenced like a lot of stuff, including like the present day music. It's influenced, uh, if you talk about it, like in music in America, it's influenced jazz, it's influenced blues, it's influenced uh, salsa and samba, it's, it inclu it's influenced. Um, just a lot of like in music aspects it's influenced pop the pop music that people listen to nowadays like because you know we have afro pop afro beats afro dance hall like that's a and those like have influenced a lot of like the music that people listen to like as of right now and then you move to resources um i think in 2018 it was covered that 30 percent of like the world's resources comes from africa so like you know the gold the diamond the um uranium the iron all this stuff like it comes from africa so africa does a lot for the world and you know it, it needs a lot more appreciation and um yeah just all of that it just does a lot like if you look at like south africa like has like i think it's um most of the gold that comes from like africa south africa is the one that distributes like most of it in the production of gold so like yeah just a lot of these countries in africa we do a lot africa does a lot for the world i just had to put that out there <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Nan. So we are the originals. <laughs> Whatever is going on in the world, we started it all. <laughs> that's how that's our influence, honestly. Because I feel like with its dance, art, um, you know, like you can think of so many things that uh, somebody polishes it up. They get it from the African continent and they polish it up. And then they claim this is for whatever part of the world. But where it started is those humble places of where the, the, the first feet were walking and finding, you know, the hunters, they hunted. And now everything is polished up in every other part of the world. But artistically, I think the music is so influential. Mm -hmm. uh, because it comes, it gets into the cultural ways of being in the different communities that we find ourselves in the world. Yeah. Hannah? Yeah, I just will add that I think Africa brings creativity and diversity into the table. Um, and that creativity comes from the way of life that we have lived for centuries. Um, you know, yes, the panelists talked about music. I would also add fashion. Uh, think about how we design our clothes and it's just until recently the world doesn't even know what kind of uh, African fabrics exist and what kind of designs exist. So we bring, I think, that creativity that we have been living with for years, and that would be a different pr perspective and addition for the world. Uh, I also think about architectural designs that we have been using for years that have been uh, used through the dynasties uh, in Nubia, in Aksumai dynasty, in Morocco, other countries, uh, that we haven't been really um, sharing with the rest of the world but because of our history with colonialism or poverty, you name it. Uh, so I think we have a lot to share uh, if the world could understand what the resources exist in Africa. I think of my own home country. I come from a small island in the Caribbean, the island of Cuba, and uh, my culture would be very, very diminished without that enormous interjection of African culture our music, our dance, our literature, our arts, all of it. Uh, I, I, it's integral to, to who we are. And then, of course, I, I, I find my answer my own question. <laughs> I think it's the people. It's Africa's greatest contribution uh, to the globe today is its people and the creativity that they bring um, to every conversation. So um, thank you. OK, let's move on to a, a, a kind of difficult question, and it's actually it's, a, it's maybe not difficult, maybe it's just a realistic question. And this is one that I, I think Hannah has already uh, alluded to, and that's the question of colonialism, given that Ethiopia was not colonized by one of the, uh, the, uh, the European powers. 
So the question really is about the legacy of colonialism, which is very much in the air today all over the world, uh, not just in Africa. But, but I guess my question is, how do you feel about the impact of colonialism on Africa? Um, and, um, and specifically, the, the, I'm thinking about works of art and uh, most so many of which are in Western collections and world capitals in, in the Western world and the United States and North America as well. Um, how do you feel about these materials being outside of Africa? Uh, I mean, the whole question of repatriation, do these things need to be returned to the African continent or are they best served by being where they are? Uh, any thoughts on, 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 on colonialism and its legacy in the arts? Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's so, it's so hard you know, like say, in Mal like if I were just to take Malawi, for example, you know, we were colonized by the British. So everything has been influenced, you know, by the British. And uh, right now there's a guy in Malawi who's been there since, I don't know, like, but he came from Canada and he, he was a, he's a priest at one of the Catholic churches in Malawi, but he started, uh, a place where art, the Malawi art is appreciated. And he's one of those, I think, why I, pre I appreciate him is because I think he recognized the power of Malawians having their art and appreciating it right in our own country. And so everything that he does, uh, his name is, I can never pronounce it, like Bocha Claude. And he has a, 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 an African name, Chisari. He was given a Chisari name. Uh, but what he, he did is he made sure that the Malawians, in that, especially that part of uh, Malawi, uh, have appreciated the art so that it was not taken away. And even though it has been taken away, it might be found everywhere else in the world. But he, he has worked with the Malawians in that region to make sure that their art is right there and it's appreciated because what colonialism did was really take away our own way of thinking and look at ourselves through the eyes of the colonialists so that we didn't even see what we had and when it was being taken away we thought it was the best thing when it went away you know and we were losing it we were losing our own our essence in in the artistic way of looking at our own stuff that we had in the country so this guy what he has done he's really made sure that that has remained and malawians are making that art and the people travel to go to this place uh, where art crafts are appreciated and then traditional um traditions are also appreciated where we have i'm sure that some people are familiar with malawi we do like the traditional dance like the big dance our art is through the dance with the uh, masks and uh, where uh, messages are delivered to the people in you know in the region that we believe in the politics is through the arts you look at the, what's going on like even um mothers through the art but all that was taken away when the you know colonists came into the country and took our way of thinking in that way and so the, the impact is huge and to repatriate our art our uh, artifacts wherever they are in the world i i always wonder about that um that is it important for us to take it back or for it to be out there for people to still know who we are you know and is that appreciated when it's not appreciated i think wherever it is when it's not appreciated then i want it back hmm. but when it's teaching people our traditions, it's exposing people to our traditions, then I feel that the sharing, that's what we are all about, you know, as Africans, I don't know what Hannah and you know, so think about that, but I, I've always struggled with that. Like we take it back because uh, they're not appreciating it, they're using it, especially, you know, like gold, 
diamonds. People are, are dying because of diamonds which are taken from our from our land. And uh, <clears throat> so, do we take all that back? And <laughs> you know, how do we take all that back? Do they stop taking advantage of us when they learn what we are? If they are taking advantage of us, then we take it back. So this, this, I, I struggle with that. I don't know what my, my, you know, my friends think about that. I struggle with that. I really struggle with that because when the, uh, Africans are dying because of diamonds, are dying because of gold, are dying because of, of our own resources, then I, I am saying get off our land and you know, like leave our land um, and bring back whatever you took. You know, uh, whether it's the, our people or our resources, bring it back. Like sometimes I struggle with myself on that. So I don't know what Hannah and also think about it. Jump in, panelists. Yeah, I think it's a complicated issue. Um, I just think the world is about telling stories. And what colonialism does is to have African stories told in the eyes of colonialists instead of um, in the eyes of the storytellers and the story owners. And that translated into power. And Africa has become the most resourceful, but practically uh, lives with poverty. Mm -hmm. um, we have become the beggars, but the ones who give the input for the rest of the world. So it has created that imbalance of power. And we can talk about economic imbalance, we can talk about cultural imbalance, we can talk about uh, all of those, you know, problems that are existing in the world system. Um, but in terms of art, what I would say is, we struggled for a while let alone countries who have been colonized, Ethiopia who has never been colonized, our artifacts have been looted because opportunities were created during war, because we were vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the arts were stolen and taken into Western countries. So I don't know how many of you remember, but the Axum Obelisk was returned from Italy just a few years ago. And that was literally transported to Italy, which is really amazing to me, like to take a huge stone to another country. That's how far it was. Uh, we still are in negotiation with England about our, um, you know, gold gilded crowns um, that are in the museums of in, in museums in England mm -hmm. that were stolen. So for me, if we have the ownership as an African person, if I say this is my artifact and, you know, Raphael, take it and use it, then I'm giving you the power with honesty and with willingness mm -hmm. and you can use that. And I don't have any reservation with it because I gave you with full permission. However, if, if the art is stolen, then I have a problem. That's where I say, then we have to work to return it back to where it belongs. I agree. So. Well said. <laughs> Nanso, what do you think? Well, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a really, it's a really deep topic. Um, it's, uh, it's just like Dr. Prince said, appropriation. This leads to appropriation. When you, when you take from a culture and you try to like, you know, make it like you're the one who started this. But then these uh, people, Africans, like our traditions have existed way before we were even discovered by, you know, um, the, uh, the, white, the white man, the Europeans. We, our cultures have always been there. Our artifacts, our, you know, art has always been there. So to come and to, to take from that, that's, it's cruel. And then to, you know, make it like, you know, you're the one who found it, you're the one who started this. And it just stems from like our fashion, you know, hairstyles, like food, everything's are taken and just appropriated and that's terrible. And then, you know, if the people, I say like if Africans, like if all these African countries where stuff were taken from want their stuff back, then it's like they have a right to get it back. 
because this is just tough. And it also leads up to what hurts me the most is just like Western portrayal of Africa. Like you cannot take from a, a, a continent, you cannot keep taking from a continent and then you depict it as, you know, there's nothing there, like, you know, because all, most of the time how um, it's put, Africa is portrayed in the media is just poverty, diseases, this, that, like, like there's nothing there. But there's a lot. There's rich culture, there's rich, rich tradition, resources, and just, you know, art. And you just take from it, but you want people to believe that, like, this continent is worth nothing. But you keep taking from it and you keep putting the, the its people to, you know, a lot of this stuff because a lot of, like, you know, taking like in terms of like the gold that is being taken, you're taking the resources of this country, this continent, like from different countries, and you like you're making them poorer while you're getting richer, and then you're you know making them look bad. It's it's a terrible thing to do, honestly. That's just really cruel, and I think it's something that needs to be talked about. Like the Western media needs to do better in portraying Africa. Talk about you know the different uh, countries in it. Talk about you know the different traditions, its culture. Talk about its beauty. Just you know, um, just don't be portraying it always in negative light. We don't, you know, we don't live in forests and huts or like how the media always portray it. Like they just show you nothing, like they show you animals and stuff. And then I even had uh, back in 2019, when at the end of my freshman year, there was a person who came to me and she was asking all these questions. And the way she was asking it, the summary of the whole thing, she made it look like, you know, we're just like, walk in like this forest and we see animals just walk out. I'm like, that's not what happened. What? Like, <laughs> I can't, I mean, I can't fully blame her. I can only blame the media like that portrays this stuff that gives people this kind of like, oh, this is what, uh, not even, it's like this whole continent and like people keep referring to it as a country and that also annoys me all the time. And this again goes back to colonialism. Like they always try to portray Africa as nothing. Like to bring a continent full of about 50 something countries and like portray it as a country, that's an insult. That's an insult, a lot, just that alone. And then to steal from this country, to uh, this continent, to steal from its countries and its people, that is like, it's a lot of issues that just needs to be talked about. And I'm glad, you know, to be able to, you know, put that out there just for people to think about and to just do something about it. So there's, so there's the question of actual appropriation, right? Resource extraction, the, the theft of culture, cultural mm -hmm. artifacts, things like that. But then in addition to that, there's the, as Hannah was saying, there's the, the narrative, the constructing mm -hmm. of a narrative that puts you as the, as the, uh, the, as in charge, as in power. And it leaves yeah. people as somehow deprived yet again, yeah. you know, so it's, the, but maybe the narrative is even stronger, uh, is a stronger way of, 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 suppressing the culture, um, mm -hmm. even more so than the actual theft or the actual appropriation. Yeah. Very, very provocative idea. And, 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 and it sounds very true to me. I, I wonder, you, my, I, I have a question about uh, the United States. You're all Africans living and working in the United States. Um, and, and I guess my, my question is, does, does American culture get it about Africa? So that's, that's the question. But maybe this is related to what, to what we were just discussing. How do you guys feel about the, what I think of as a change, the idea of African superheroes, African stories told through African voices, African scripts, African narration. And, and we see visually now on the big screen, African aesthetics not constructed by a colonizer, but constructed by Africans. How do you feel about that? I, I guess the question is, what's happening today in the United States that might be different? How do you think? Of, what do you think about that? So um, again, I'll just talk. Like again, and I think um, I think America, as of right now, is doing like a little better in terms of like media portrayal of like Africa in like you know movies. It's no longer you know where they show you again huts and like forests and like all this stuff, they're starting to do better, but it, they, they, they still need to do a lot more. There's a lot more that needs to be done. I mean, you can see the change in like, uh, like the, again, portrayal of African, like, you know, media in movies. You can see from, uh, I don't know if you guys know the movie Coming to America, uh, uh, Coming to America. That's Coming to America 2. Yeah, and the second one just came out. That's, yeah, it's, and it's, you can tell the difference. Like, the second one does a lot better job. Because like, again, in this modern time and age, like people are starting to, you know, do better and like, you know, try to portray something as it should be portrayed. I mean, they still need to do a lot more, but it's way better compared to the first one. 
and you can like see that they're moving like a bit forward and like you know they're progressing but i feel like they still need to do a lot better it, i cannot still believe that it had to take the black panther movie to come out before people started to realize that africa is like worth so much more there's so much more in africa than you know what they initially show you and that's just um that's kind of hurtful that it took all that time just for one movie to come out and start to change people's ideas but i'm glad the movie did come out and start to bring up this discussion and stuff and i just i think um this America as a whole, there are people who are in America that are, you know, doing better and like, you know, educating themselves and like, you know, getting that information out there. But America as a whole, I feel like still needs to listen to a lot of people. Um, um, I can change it. Do you? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Joyce. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's tricky because uh, whether it's Wakanda forever, um, you know, the Black Panther movie, and then coming to America, I think it, to me it's a cry to uh, say there's an Africa that exists that's not a shithole country because somebody uh, actually said something about shithole countries out there like he, and so it's as if there's a cry and this fight to say there is an Africa that exists that's not a shithole country uh, that's not uh, all this negative stuff now, in the process, though, there's an exaggeration, <laughs> you know, there's an exaggeration that becomes a fantasy, like a, a fantastical Africa that exists out there. Um, the good thing is there is that exposure, like, you know, of other, of the traditions of Africa. Uh, so by you seeing Wakanda forever or coming to America, that's not, a, you know, like a, what Africa is about. It's just a little bit of what Africa is about. Because th these movies, put, there's a Western uh, way of portraying Africa, uh, which doesn't give it the traditional way of being in, the, you know, in Africa. They can show clothes and all that stuff, but it's the, what happens everyday life in, that, in the movies that, that is not uh, portrayed. But uh, with the, your question, Dr. Khan, I feel like uh, there are many, many Americans that have gone to see what Africa is about. And when they come back here, they tell fellow Americans what Africa is. And, the, and so I'm, I'm always hopeful that in this, when you meet people in the small in communities, I think you, when you are on one-on-one -on -one or when you are on the community level, when you are involved in the community, you meet people that have lived in Africa and that bring the picture, the real picture of you know, what Africa is about. And so there's some awareness and I think the people that go themselves, they want to learn more and so they teach others and so this exposure of Africa to Americans, I feel like it's growing more and more. But there was a minute there where Africa was put back into the, in, you know, in, into the rubbish. Yeah. But people that really appreciate what Africa is about, the origins of Africa, and their own origins as they struggle to figure out themselves and their connection that they have to the African continent. I think those people are the ones that are like maybe here in the United States, they want to show that Africa. And so I, yeah, there's just something about like, and I know I appreciate what Nose is saying about the movies, but I also want to make sure that people don't look at that and think that's all Africa. Because mm -hmm. the people that are in those movies are Western uh, African Americans. They're not Africans. And so they will put that twist of the American way. And so you don't get the whole exposure of what Africa is in, you know, in those movies. And uh, yeah. Well, let me, let me extend that question a little bit further and I'll, I'll pitch this to, uh, to Hannah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you connect with African America? 
and do you um, do you identify with African America? Uh, I mean, I understand what uh, what Dr. Mpandi was saying that that even African Americans have a cliched notion of Africa, right? Yes. So what's uh, so so? Tell me what your relationship is with African America, you know, in that particular community. Well, Raphael, I don't think I can speak for that because I am not African American. I'm not an American at this moment. I am a student from Africa, so I identify mostly to African identity and to Ethiopian identity. And I don't know how it is like for someone with an African descent who grew up here and identifies with an African American identity. Um, and I don't know what what that identity and what that narrative means. Uh, but when I relate it to back to your question and the discussion uh, prior to that, um, I think it all goes back to changing narratives because we have heard about this powerful narratives, just like we've been saying, that has been told with the Western and European eyes about what Africa is and what Africa should represent. And mostly this deplorable ways of depicting what Africa is. So the movies that you see in Hollywood, they are mostly trying to change that narrative. Um, but again, I have like we are paying attention to Black Panther and coming to America because they are the most popular. But I can name other movies, Hollywood movies that are really doing terrible job about representing Africa. So it's not really um, about all good and all bad. It's just when Africans are represented and they come to the table, they bring their creativity they bring that way of life, they bring their intention to change that narrative. Uh, that's based on the research, of course, and it's, it's really good when research is represented and when way of life is represented. I think we can all benefit from a much clearer sense of what Africa is, and I think we can all benefit from actually hearing African voices telling that, those stories, telling that narrative. Uh, and, that the, and, and really the whole world needs to hear this, not just America, right? Um, I agree. I, we, uh, we're running kind of towards the end of our interview here, but I have a, there's a, there's a question on, uh, from in the chat box that I'd like to share with you, and that is, um, tell us what's your favorite uh, piece of African art, book, painting, music, or sculpture is. Any, what's, what's your favorite? What do you always turn to? I will what? start because I'm already oh, under. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You're a student, so everything is fresh for you. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that comes to mind because I haven't been talking about it is the Ethiopian painting. Um, mm -hmm. So there is the this Orthodox Christian, like traditionally Orthodox Christian painting. Uh, that's really unique to our country, I would say, that I always enjoy looking at um so yeah i think i think that's what comes to mind <laughs> yeah it's a marvelous painterly tradition two thousand year old tradition figurative tradition it's beautiful yes lovely um dr Mpandi. well you know it's so weird because like in, Ma in malawi we we have all these writers in Malawi. Uh, some of them, their works, like uh, Dr. Jack Mapanje, who has wrote lots of poetry books that I used at the university. But what's so funny is I think of Dr. Ma uh, Dr. Jack Mapanje, but then I'm also thinking of Chinua Achebe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because his books I used to teach in my classes. And uh, yeah, so we have all these great writers on the African continent yeah. and their books are used worldly and the uh, universities out in the West, they use uh, their books of poetry, of stories, like uh, Chinua right. Achebe, written a lot, a lot. <laughs> Things fall apart is is Things fall apart. One of my favorites that I used to teach in my English literature class. Yeah. I could like teach without the book because I had used it so many times. 
yeah so that you know that's what comes and then like music i know this might sound weird but um we had this lovely woman miriam makeba who she passed but that was our queen you know that was our queen uh with the music and in malawi who somebody who was quite equivalent to her um was mary chizanjankoma very African woman who sang beautiful music to us. She just passed away this year. Uh, I think COVID got her, but. Uh, Not so. Jump in. Favorite art? Oh, for me, it's, uh, it has to do with a lot of like, I love storytelling, uh, whether it comes in the form of like writing or it comes in music. So that's why I read a lot of books and I love reading books. And thank you for mentioning Chimwa Chebe. He's a really good. Um, he's, he's a really good author. Him, it is, I recommend him to anybody. Things Fall Apart was like growing up, like they had even a movie adaptation that like, they made us watch just in school and stuff. And it was, it was really good. There's him. There's also Chimamanda. Um, I, I don't remember Chimamanda's last name, but Chimamanda, she's a Ngozi Adichie. I think that's her last name. But yeah, she's a very um, great uh, Nigerian author. She has a lot of books from Half of the Yellow Sun. There's a movie adaptation for that. There's a Purple Hibiscus. There's Things Around Your Neck. There's a, she, wrote, she wrote a lot of books. And then it comes down to also the music. Again, I was talking about you know, Afro pop, Afro beat, Afro dance hall. Like, uh, I just love listening to Af African music because it makes me happy. Makes you, just puts you up in the, like, the dancing spirit. And I'm not a good dancer. Um, it kind of skipped me and went to my other siblings, but still. Um, it just gives you, makes you happy, gives you life and joy. So like, you know, when you're cooking, when you're reading, when you're just like wanting to chill, music is just a very good way of, of communicating. And I also love um, African music because it's also a form of storytelling. Like there's always storytelling in African music that just gets you and it just puts you in, you know, uh, some of it makes you feel sad because the story it's telling is sad, some will make you happy. Just it's, just, it's just a very good way of just conveying your emotions and it's really good. So I'd recommend just reading books or like listening to music. Bravo. Well, folks, uh, unfortunately we have to wrap this up. I wanna first of all, thank you to our panelists. You were marvelous. Appreciate your uh, joining us and, and sharing your stories and your lives with us for a, a brief hour today. Thank you so much. And I also want to invite everyone to please come check out the shows, whether you do that virtually or live at uh, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. And I wanna announce that in two weeks at this same time, so on April 15th, Thursday, April 15th, between noon and one o'clock, we're gonna have a, a, a conversation with Ashley Rickman, who will be talking about the uh, splendid Cuba textiles that are in the Homage to Africa exhibition. So again, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Everyone, join up. This was really great. <laughs> thank you so much.